Hi everyone, um, I'm Peter Neubauer from Neo Technology. We are um, uh, supporting the Neo4j uh, graph database project. And I just got from uh, Michael Hunger this little wand, so I really would like to <laughs> do it. I can only recommend this, this is absolutely fantastic. Um, a recap, the NoSQL data models, I mean, we, we, we have heard about them. Um, we have the key value stores, we have the column families, and we have the document databases, and and we have the graph databases. There are a couple of them. Uh, they have been around for quite a long time, um, but not worked with that much. Um, basically, the, the scalability issues we had, w w we had a number of speakers here uh, saying that, that the main scalability issues for people are uh, failover and replication instead of sharding. So, and and we we are seeing the same thing uh, from from our uh, from our projects that are using graph databases. It seems that that uh, that graphs on nowadays hardwares are actually providing quite good value for for a lot of for a lot of things. Um, what is special with with all these databases as opposed to, for instance, object databases? Everything we have seen here uh, are are basically databases that separate the logic and the data. They have a they have a uh, special query language. They have they you you can you can have data coming into the database and then query it from another system uh, separate from from logic. That is one thing that that separates them from, for instance, object databases where everything is glued into into your your object model. Um, most of, of these support of ad hoc queries, and uh, of course you need to be persistent. Neo4j is persistent. It is actually it's, uh, in in that uh, manner n an asset database, which means it's really persistent. When you commit your transaction, it will be stored on disk, and it will survive the plug pulling and come up again. So that's and uh, and they need to scale good enough. So the the property graph model supported by Neo4j is one that has nodes. They're really just just IDs uh, with relationships between these nodes, and then we have properties on these. Uh, these properties are are really key value pairs, so you can have different properties on each, like both nodes and relationships, and they don't need to be are the same or, or conform to any schema or uh, anything. How do you query this structure? There is a, a, uh, a Java traversal framework. Neo4j is written in Java and, and executes in Java in the, in the JVM. Um, and and there's a, th this is to, to initiate type safe lazy traversals into the data structure and provides very, very high performance. There are other bindings. Uh, since people are embedding Neo4j into other frameworks, we have we have JRuby bindings. We have uh, C# -sharp bindings via the the REST API that I that I will demo then. And uh, you can query uh, Neo4j via Gremlin, which is kind of an XPath language. I will try to demo that too. Um, and and of course RDF is one of the graphy uh, query languages. The model is not that explicit for more programmatic graph use, but but you can do it. And of course, if you if you use Ruby on Rails or Ru or Django, it plugs into the query mechanisms that are provided there. It just looks like like any other persistent source. What can you use graphs for? As you probably know, the graph model is uh, the other big model that normalizes uh, data uh consistently beside the hierarchy uh, the the uh, relational model so so the whole semantic web and rdf is about normalizing data down to triples to statements uh in instead of instead of tables and columns so so you can really represent a lot of a lot of stuff the uh, uh, during later years the social graph is of course one of the more visible graphs, especially since Facebook now talked about the social graph and the, the open graph API and, and, and all that stuff. 
and wants to bolt on like all the other information in the world on onto this. But but of course you have you have others. For instance, spatial data um, is is a graph, and uh, and since you have relationships that can really have any properties, you can you can just mix them up. What I wanted to do today is just uh, show you a couple of projects uh, um, approaches how to how to use this graph in different in different areas. Um, I guess there's always a question: How do you how do you model data in in, in graphs? How how do you do that? Uh, it's it's quite like the object rela object relational mapping is 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 uh, with with Hibernate or something is quite well known. But but how do you solve your data problems in graphs? Uh, financial data is something that we that we are seeing where you where you like monitor transaction flows uh, in a graph in order to to filter out. Uh, discrepancies and 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 uh, changes over time that might be fraud, for instance. So I wanted to to just go through and uh, and show you a couple of use cases that that, that we see where where there is like uh, interest and where there's interesting stuff going on in 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 the graph. Just to give you some idea what you can use this stuff for. Um, our first. Uh, uh Describe a bit the the new REST bindings in Neo4j. H how many have how many have ever like touched Neo4j of you? Okay, that's that's some of you. <laughs> that's good. Um, I would just like show an example of mapping objects to graphs without without destroying like the the uh, the underlying data structure. Um, I'll show you a. A little routing JRuby um, thing that we did for uh, with OpenStreetMap data, just on on, on little thing, yeah. but uh, but that worked for quite big data too. And then like multiple indexes in in a GIS application, and if you have time, we can actually run a recommendation algorithm over the linked data set out there. Uh, the network is quite slow here. I want to do that live. But we we will see. I would like to have like a music recommendation algorithm that that does a heuristic over the, over the semantic web. Okay, REST in Neo4j. Um, we uh, of course REST uh, for 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 most of the people means like JSON. Um, we try to go a bit farther and and uh, and actually add all the all, all the nice uh, features in there that uh, that you need that you want to have like in the self-describing. REST API. Here we go. So, so I just thought I would like start a REST server and just show it to you. Um, let's see here. Um, let's start that one. So, what we do is to to just uh, serve and see what we can do. We will use curl. That's nice. Oh, I have Swedish. Here we go. So what we ask for is is the the local host's root, which is nine 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 nine. Now the database is started. What we get is actually like uh, full references to where we can find out more on things. So so if we go to node zero, we will get to the to the root node, right? So node zero. And we would get a description uh, of the node. You see here is actually the the data. There's no data on that node, but there are the outgoing and incoming relationships here, and it describes how you can get the types, how you can get the canonical like properties, and so on and so on. So we tried to make this very intuitive. Uh, it's it's a it's verbose. Uh, we're thinking of like putting in like a switch that after initial discovery you can switch off all this all this craft because it's like a, a bit of network overhead. Um, so if you would like to do something with it, we can just try to do a post to the node URL and and actually put in a, a node with the data like Mr. Anderson here. So what we get back is a description of 
of the node and again here we we got the data so if you look at this um, you can you can switch to to this view and you will you will actually get a HTML view of this I, it's it's the same it's actually the same API it's just the um, let me see here we have the Mr. Anderson right so let's let's just see uh, we can do that on another node Morpheus and then we have like a uh, here uh, a post that actually creates a relation on node zero we create a relation to node one of type root so if we do all this let me see oh. like here Think we're there, or we think? Uh, okay, let's see what we got. So now we have at least a relationship back to node zero, right? And uh, there we go. That's the relationship. It's a full. It's a full, like a first class citizen in the graph. So you can actually address it, even in. So, so you get the start and the end node and, and, and the properties. You can set properties on relationships too, as, as I said, but uh, we, we're not doing that here. So that's, that's kind of the REST API. You can, you can of course, ask it stuff. Um, so, so I, haven't, I haven't got anything here, but, but basically what you, what you put in is traversal descriptions in, in JavaScript, in JSON, where you, where you take like a node and uh, and then you can from there ask uh, things. So you have like slash traverse here. So so that is that is the base for a low level API o onto onto the graph database. There's a number of extensions built on that, like like PHP and uh, and C sharp and even Python extension uh, extension now. So let's see. Here we go. Um, Indexing and querying is built in. We u we use like built-in Lucene for doing text searches. Uh, it's it's wrapped in a way that that it participates in the same transaction. If you commit a change to the node space, it will be reflected in Lucene and rolled back if that not if that is not working. So you can actually keep things up to date. Um, we recently built a little wrapper of the Open Graph API and hacked the the uh, Facebook client, so you can actually point them to to your own little graph and do mashups. I mean, Facebook has really nice uh, uh, client development tools; mm -hmm. they're they, they're good at that. Um, JRuby and Scala have built their own um, uh, REST API. You can you can check it out if you like. So the graph for objects are uh, they're different. Um, there are different approaches there. Uh, over, overall, the goal is to keep the domain data clean in, in the graph, not, not to introduce too much craft and overhead. So you can actually do your, your domain queries. There are two approaches One is uh, that, that we are seeing. One is uh, annotation-based, which is very Java and uh, Groovy-centric. So you annotate the objects like in GPA or, or something. And, uh, and and that's the case in Grails, in 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 Jofarneo, in Ru, in GPI, and then you have mixed and based approach, which which are which are typical for the for the scripting languages like like uh, Django and JRuby, uh, and then then you have like the REST clients. So I wanted to show you um, what what an object graph mapping looks like in Jofarneo because that is that's quite beautiful, or it's it's uh, interesting I think. So let's see uh, this. Here we have here we have a little uh, role and user, like kind of a kind of a. Uh, let's see, we have users, basically. Let me just do it like this. And users can have roles. They ha can have like uh, first name, last name. This is indexed. You can you can search for the for the ID. Uh, in, in Lucene, and then they can have direct roles. So the roles are, are like if they're an administrator or whatever. And roles can contain roles, and you want to go up and do some kind of like ACL, like uh, uh, lookup here. 
uh, the the role will be the name of the of the connection you will draw there. Uh, and uh, and roles again, they can have uh, a children here. Uh, actually, the roles are connected by a parent relationship to the other roles. So the children is actually in inverse lookup on the parent relationship. It goes like the other way around, which is which is children. Um, same thing here, users point to roles by having members, like being members, and, and this points the other way around to have, to have a lookup on the members on, 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 uh, on a role. So, so this looks something like, like this. I'm not opening this here. But you see that, that we have here the root node, and then we have a, uh, an object super type, kind of. So we have a lot of we we have a lot of users here, or three of them: a basic user, an admin user, and uh, and some other user, which is a hotel agent. Uh, and and they they have a type relationship here. So we know that these nodes are kind of of the of the same type of the user type here. And then we have a lot of roles. You we have the basic role here. Uh, then we have a sub role here you have the parent relationship here parent 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 and here you have the admin role so what we were seeing here was actually like roles looking up users here now what's interesting is that that in this model th this is pretty straightforward but you can actually bake in like deep graph traversals into this model by for instance defining this here oh let me see um role members here this is actually a traverser so so here you get in a node which is a which is a role here and you do a breadth first traverser and search to the end of graph all the role relationships that that are that are coming incoming and all the user role relationships that are that are parent so you go down from from here again From here, you go here and traverse all the all the parent relationships. If you have a role here, you go down all these and traverse all these to find all the users. So you can do do arbitrary deep queries to to fetch your objects, which is pretty neat because it it it, it actually gives you like deep access to your graph, or you could do that from from other ways too, of course. So that's that's another interesting thing now routing um, we were we were doing a uh, routing test with OpenStreetMaps on uh, uh, on on the data set of Romania which is like 70 million 70 million nodes uh, relationships that are roads and then and then 20 20 million nodes that are basically like crossings and uh, and they had a cost with them associated so so we decided to implement the a star algorithm for that the basic al algorithm is that that you that you look like you have the end node and the start node and you look for every segment if you get like by calculating the cost here if you get closer to your to your target node if you don't for instance here you break so so this would be like broken here and you would instead take this road here so in in code to do this you can actually use again a domain model to create your node space you just see this wow the screen just so you can create a a domain model. You have a road here, and you include. This is the only thing you need to do. Uh, and 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 you do a a property cost on your road. This is JRuby. Uh, and then you have another class that has like longitude and latitude and name. The name is indexed, and uh, then it has roads to other waypoints via road relationship, of course. So and on the on, on these you have cost. Th th this is like meters or something. 
Uh, and if you connect them, you just you just do a new road to from from here to the other, and you update it with the distance. The distance is is then the uh, the geodetical distance between these nodes. So if you if you look at this, this is just the the algorithm for that. So if we create a little uh, a little waypoint network here, uh, we had we had geocoding in there, but but yeah, I'm not showing you that. Uh, th then you just do that that little algorithm here, and and this performs quite good. On this network, the the A star algorithm performed the shortest route uh, uh, w with a depth of like 5,500 hops. Um, on on a length of 700 kilometers, about about three seconds. So, so if you have a couple of hundred hops, that goes down to like 70, 60 milliseconds. So it gets really really fast, and you can actually keep these these networks. Uh, as as we heard from from the MongoDB guys, it's um, you can hold a lot of data in in RAM and on big machines nowadays. So so a couple of hundred of million of objects. Goes actually uh, in, into like 20, 30 gigabyte RAM, so you can hold everything there and be persistent at the same time. So you get in RAM speeds, and you get like asset persistence for what you do. And then the main problem is to to replicate instead of of scale. So if you do this, uh, we'll see that I would just. Uh, Remove the database and and then get the the route that goes via New York and Kansas City and Santa Fe to San Francisco, not the route that you normally would do. Uh, that goes the shortest number of hops here. So this is how it looks. You see in the JRuby bindings, actually the class name attribute is here a, a one property on the on on the node. So the the object binding is a bit different but still it gives you like totally free access to to what you want to do with the graph it doesn't destroy your data it's still there you just create it with with an easier language and it doesn't get in your way now another thing that that uh that I wanted to show you uh I'm not sure what the what the time is what's the time oh, okay Cool. Uh, I I another interesting thing with graphs is that that a every relationship is of the same order. I mean, it's a, it's a first-class sentence, and it doesn't really matter what kind of relationship that is. Uh, in in GIS, for instance, you you always almost always have kind of complex data sets. They mix like quadri indexing with uh, with hierarchies. Uh, you have a time index. Like if you have in what order things happened. And and you might have like an on-demand index. I wanted to show you how, how how this looks in a live application. So the quad tree. I don't know how many of of you know that it's a it's a very it's a very common geographical figure. You 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 order your uh, area into tiles, and then you you have kind of like an index over these tiles. So first you have a node that that goes over over your whole area and then it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller so it's really it, it's really a hierarchical structure that that gives you the bounding boxes of stuff so when you drop down there you will if you, if you look for this you will drop down from the from from the node to the uh to the tiles that fully enclose your target area everything else you can discard and everything totally inside if you're looking for for polygons you can just drop down to the points and and maybe do like a ranking on on what is left there and for the for the things that are like overlapping if you if you search for circle you might drop down one level and do the same thing again so so you can uh, uh, exclude a lot of a lot of data while you drop down this index so it's it's, it's very well used there are like r plus trees and others but but yeah so just see if I can. Actually, we have a project that is soon to be open sourced, which is the uh, Amanzi Wireless Explorer. Uh, it's a it's a UDIC based application. 
Uh, and we're working on a new for spatial uh, Google Summer of Code project to provide a lot of this functionality that you see there in this. UDIG is, is a visualization tool for, for Java. Um, let's see. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's see if I can do that. And uh, we will just add some shape files to it. So we see that this is like Germany. Uh, this is OpenStreetMap. And uh, just take these shape files. Here we got Germany. And uh, these are not in, in Neo4j now. These are files we're working on getting them into the graph because they're much, much faster uh, than, than reading, the reading these things from files. And what is good in the graph is you can actually like correlate to all these points. If they are outside the data structure, they're just like useless if you, if you, if you want to do things. So what we will do now is to, to add some data. This is an application geared towards like cell tower uh, networks and, and like the analysis of all these things. So we will add like a CSV file with the location of cell towers to it. So we will zoom to the data, and uh, uh, there they are. So we'll zoom in here a bit, and you see the cell towers with their with the antennas. Can you see them? So there, and they, I, I could load more more map data. It's just uh, that that it that is not really like good showable. But what is interesting is that that here we have the the, the file. And under there, we have we, we have the parent of all the uh, all the cell towers. So this is a hierarchical structure, and then we have all the cell towers. So if you look at this cell tower or this, it's highlighted here, and you can you can actually go down and select the antennas. So this is the uh, these are the different antennas. Uh, when you look at them, you can actually show them. In this application, the graph is actually visible. So, so it's kind of interesting to see that here you have the cell tower, uh, and here you have the three antennas. They're child's uh, children to, to this. And then you have in what order this thing was imported. This is like another cell tower, another cell tower, another cell tower. And all of these cell towers are children again from Aachen. What you have here is is actually the geospatial index that is that is put on top of these cell towers. So if I if I expand this, it's a lot of data. But you see, there's like a lot of a lot of data loaded. You have the Aachen city, and you have the site, and so on and so on. It goes on here. But what you see here is the level uh, level zero index, the bounding box here, the uh, the max and the min. So this goes up like 300 levels up which actually is a bug, it should be like 40 or something. Um, so this is interesting. If I, if I go to, to this, so this is just the antenna. So now I want to do a little distribution on this. If I, if I do, for instance, a distribution on this data set on the, on the azimuth, that is the, the angle of these antennas, I will actually do like a s fast calculation of all the cell towers and can now see which of these cell towers are pointing at, at what direction. So I can start like analyzing different graphs, basically. Uh, I can even like change stuff and so on. There's a lot more to it. You can like import drive data and so on. It's, it's uh, super <laughs> cool. But uh, what is interesting is that if I go now to the um, to the graph again, we see that suddenly we got an aggregate index here on this on this little thing. So this is actually the 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 azimuth aggregate index that was that was done while I was doing the diagram. So next time I come here, I will get the diagram directly. If I if I go there, you see that. Oh, I will put that away. You see all the connected nodes. These are 18 nodes here, uh, 0 to 18 azimuth. 
and uh, this is like the azimuth kind of index and it 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 refers to to 18 antennas that are in different towers so we have just introduced an on demand index here so this is like the third or fourth index in this graph um and and really like the whole application just displays uh, different traversals this is like a, a hierarchical traversal this is a quad tree uh, uh this is a this is another index just coloring the nodes and so on and so on and you can like go on like this and still you have the base data to for instance introduce a a social network or say that give me everything that's of type theater or whatever it might introduce a bit like of of crunching at the lowest level where you need to do a set operation at, at the lowest level but still that's quite fine Okay, that is uh, that is another thing that that I think is good. We are trying to extract a number of these interesting features uh, uh, into the the Neo4j spatial project that is uh, emerging on on GitHub to to put Neo4j as a full geo tool back end feature store, uh, both from say shape files and and OpenStreetMaps um, uh, into production. So the last thing I I wanted to show you is is actually a recommendation algorithm that is not using Neo4j. Um, I'm working with Marco Rodriguez on a project that is that is Gremlin. It's like we call it Perl for graphs. <laughs> it's like XPath based and there's like a lot of curly stuff. Uh, it's very effective. It's not it's not super nice. I mean you, ha you probably have your uh, stuff but but it's it, it's very very effective for handling graphs. It goes on, on over the property graph model and it has a number of implementations uh, amongst others actually MongoDB since since like a, a document model is kind of like a poor man's graph it's just a hierarchy instead of a, a network so you can actually put these things in uh, and the interesting thing is there's like a sale um, uh, a, a, a sale gateway and uh, let me just so show you a recommendation. So what we are trying to do now is that we are we're using this uh, linked data uh, graph that is out there. I don't know if you have heard of it. I mean, all all these like DBpedia and and uh, and Amazon are exposing their their data as RDF and 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 linked data. There's a lot of there's a lot of buzz going on there. So what we have here is uh, that we that we start at at DBpedia with the Grateful Dead. Um, we have a number of, of statements here. Uh, an RDF graph is quite, you can't have properties on things, so it's, it's, it's really just URIs. This is a URI, this is a URI, and this is a URI. So what we want to do is, we want to go uh, along certain paths that don't really exist in, in, uh, in reality, it's just statements. And then we want to see if there's a name to these things. So the name is, a, is, is really like a literal, and we want to apply a random walk. We want to randomly choose these things. So next next time I, I go back and do the same thing again, I might go this way and return Bill Kreutzmann because he was a member and he has a name. And the third, uh, I, I actually might end up here uh, since I go along like all everything that is like in the same band and past members. So I'm trying to find things that are related to the Grateful Dead uh, and r do a rank of them. What that looks in code is is this. Uh, let me see. Here we go. So what we what we do here is we actually go to we 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 open this thing. Let me see. Uh, I hope I have. Uh, let me see. Just start it. And uh, we we open the graph, so now no, now we have a connection to the semantic web, um, and we will just um, put ourselves at uh, the DBpedia at Grateful Dev, the the resource. Okay, now let's see if we can see all the outgoing edges from this. I'm not really sure how the Oh, it works. So what we see is a lot of statements here, you see, and it's a lot of like garbage data. The, the semantic web, this is life, is not nice, but but we have a number of 
edges here that actually are interesting stuff. So there's like years active and there's type and label and everything. What is interesting here is that thing. Associated band, that sounds good. From Grateful Dead to the other ones. So so let's go along these lines and uh, and add these namespaces that we want to have to a list, just just uh, like this. So we say, oh yeah, same as an associated acts and musical artists and past members and same as that's that's what we want to traverse along, right? Um, so now let's see if we can do that. We actually go along these labels. You see that here. We go like from here where we are, the out edges that match these labels, the invertices, that's the other side. Then again, out edges that have a friend of a friend name property, or like the R of friend of friend name, which is the usual way to describe names in RDF. And then we go to the to the other side and get the value of that. Since since like the RDF graph is quite verbose. So let's try to do that. So then we see, and we did dupe that, so we, we take away the duplicates. And that might take a bit of, uh, well, it depends on if you if you switch off your stuff. You see like the, the web out there is quite cruel. So uh, uh, things, are, things are sometimes not working and so. So what we will get is a number of, a number of names that, that might be interesting for us. So what we do now is exactly what I, what I described before. We, we put ourselves here and then we have a, a URI here that is our starting. This is for like the dot, like this is where we stand. This is a kind of a... Then we have a variable that is E, that's the energy, and we have a result map that is just a map. And for like 20 times what we do is we try to place ourselves along these label relationships randomly we we place ourselves there and we print that out and if we find one then we actually look if we can find a name and if we can find a name we're updating the map with the current energy and uh, repeating this stuff so we, we we try to go out like out from from where we are if we can't find anything then we hop back instead of like updating ourselves to one hop farther that is that is what uh and and so for every step we deduct 15 percent of the of the energy so so as things get hit like by a different path they might be more interesting they get more energy and as we go out they get less energy so things that are in the vicinity of stuff this is a heuristic that will hopefully gain some uh, some results. So what we get here is these uh, these are the stuff that are connected via labels and they have a name. So this is quite nice. Now we want to do a heuristic over this and actually see how important they are. So let's run this. Uh, and then of course we just sort the map and and display it. So now we see that it's that's going through and we see it's actually following the the semantic web here. This is not longer freebase, uh, DBP. It's freebase. It's it's it, it's a lot of other stuff. So you can run this in in live, and then with the results, the 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 weighted results, you can actually go into your file system or your iTunes library and just start playing. And while that is playing, you take the next one. This is awfully slow because it's really on the on on the, on the semantic web. But if you run that on Neo4j, it, it's like Neo4j is doing on on normal hardware like. 2 million nodes per per second and these are i don't know 100 nodes or something so th so this is very very fast but i just wanted to show you that this is actually like life uh it's it's 20 runs so it's not 100 here we go so um so here we got the uh the weighted list of this jerry garcia and grateful dead itself so it linked back in some way and so on and so on. So you could actually like look for that in, 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 in iTunes or something. So this is kind of cool because you can treat the, the web as a graph. Um, so <laughs> this was that's awesome. There's a number of other use cases that I'm that I'm not going to highlight here. We have the, the, the common thing of activity streams where you 
where you have like write bursts in relational databases. Uh, since if if people follow other people's uh, people and they and they want to to see what what has happened, what you usually do is that you can't really calculate that in real in real time. So you have a you have a desktop or or latest event uh, um, table that that you update. So so that that w w with real fast traverses you can you can push that write load back into being read load so you're actually traversing these things process automation is uh, very different from from web there's like a lot of the lot of uh, a lot emphasis on write write throughput sensors are delivering like a lot of data like 50 hertz uh, 600 sensors that's that's a lot um so and you and you then have like a construct to actually filter these th things into petri nets and 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 whatnot. Uh, object oriented reporting that's that's quite interesting. Once you have like object oriented things onto your data, it's no problem to do like Jasper reports or report anywhere or or, or just do scripting in 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 your framework of choice. You can do that. Yeah, why graph databases? Uh, the world is getting complex. Um, Master data management is, is is another interesting thing where you have your root data in all conceivable kind of directions and you don't really know how you will use it in downstream systems. We are not the only ones. There are like traditional players in the in the RDF world, for instance Allegro Graph. Uh, FlockDB is what I would call like a double replicated uh, document database, but but still, I mean, it's handling a, what Twitter is perceiving as a graph. Um, then we have Sonus, Achim is here, actually. Um, Pregel, don't know much about it. And, uh, and actually the first, uh, the first uh, object or in the database, uh, objectivity is moving into the, this new space and, and, and put like a graph layer on top of it, which is, which is kind of interesting. It, it validates the concept because these guys know that for a long time. Yeah, and uh, Neo4j has a lot of bindings and so on. So let's just skip that. We are hiring. We need more people. So if you're interested in graphs and are a kick ass programmer, come to me afterwards. I won't shoot you. Questions? Yes. No. Oh, uh, the question was if there's always a mandatory root node. No, there isn't. We are creating, like Neo4j is creating one for you, but you can easily just uh, uh, get rid of that, like delete it, and even set another what we call a reference node. It's just to have a have an entrance in the graph, so you can you can just set it to something else that that is closer to your domain or whatever, or or you don't. Yes. Yes. Ab oh, oh. The the question was, can you can you query for absent relations? Yes, you can. Uh, it's just a simple test. I mean, if there's a relation there or not. Uh, however, uh, right now, in in at least Neo4j, the the relationships are not are not indexed. We will add that pretty soon. So if you treat the graph as a as a key value store and you have like one node and then like a couple of million nodes just beside it uh, then you would probably like to 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 index that hop in order to not need to to load these things uh, uh actually sequentially so just to to have a negation right yes The question was if the uh, if there's integration to the to the top ma map APIs. Yes, there are projects. These are open source projects that that, that map it, um, and we have a Google Summer of Code project right now that is integrating this, the the like Neo4j with a number of visualization tools and and uh, Giphy and Cytoscape and so on. So yes, it's not a it's not a big deal, but we are not supporting like out of the box the whole topic map API. But it's not it's not a it's not a big problem. Yes. Uh, 
the first question was, do we support multiple graphs in the same VM? And the other one, uh, do you, uh, can you have multiple relationships between nodes? Uh, both yes. Uh, in, uh, um, in the same VM, you can have what you would call like named graphs. There's no, there's no um, mandatory uh, like connection between all the nodes. If you, if you can find the entrance to your graph via indexes, for instance, that's fine, or you know the ID of some node there. Uh, the risk is that you have like uh, nodes hanging around that you won't that that you won't reference anymore. Uh, but but you can absolutely have uh, two Neo4j instances in the same JVM. Um, the other thing is uh, relationships between the same nodes. Absolutely, you can even have relationships of the same type between the same nodes with the same attributes. <laughs> so yes. Yes. Uh, do we handle file attachments or blobs? We are handling them, but we are not optimized for it. Uh, I would. We, you can store byte arrays as like or JSON documents or whatever, but but we are not a data structure that is optimized for, for instance, like something like like Cassandra does. If if you do that, you would probably. Uh, we have a couple of of uh, installations where wh where you're combining like a another store that's actually storing the the blobs scalable and you just store the keys because that's not something that Neo4j is optimized for. Do we handle hypergraphs? Yes, a hypergraph is modelable in a property graph by just introducing a, 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 a node in between that represents the edge so you can actually have like a, a between hop. Yes, we, we would we would not represent a hypergraph, we would represent a property graph that has a special traversal to it. It has a special layout. So that works out pretty nice. Yes? Uh, do we have heard of people doing uh, rule-based reasoning on, on Neo4j? It depends on. Uh, is it good for it? Um, when it comes to RDF, uh, we are supporting OWL, so you can impose constraints on, on the graph via the, the OWL layers. When it comes to reasoning and traversing this, we are actually like projecting the these statements into into such a graph that you saw, like the semantic graph, and and that means in deep traversals, our Sparkle and these things are about graph matching. Really, we actually like matching graphs. We're going in there and trying to figure out if there's a subgraph. Um, so in in deep in deep queries, we're faster than than other RDF stores. In shallow queries, where you just want to have like a name and the person that had that name, um, I would say it's not it's not the best one because these are very flat structures. The graph doesn't really doesn't really play its magic. Okay, then uh, thank you very much. <laughs>